Okay, I think we can start. Uh, welcome everybody. For me, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Porable in, uh, in, the, in the IAC. Paul is the chief scientist from Planetary Small Bodies of NASA. Uh, Paul is a, has a bachelor in astronomy and physics, uh, a master and a PhD in geology, and he's a planetary scientist. Uh, his uh, main interest is in the, in the field of the asteroids, and in particular in the nearer objects, is, uh, is what he's going to explain us. And, and as, as a chief scientist of NASA in this field, he's been working in almost all the uh, NASA missions to asteroids, and in particular, in particular he's very well involved in uh, the, the two missions that are already visiting asteroids that uh, it is Osiris Rex is a NASA mission that we are also involved in and uh, Hayabusa too, the one that uh, Eddie is involved in so <coughs> Paul has been working in also in the previous Hayabusa in the, in the collection of the samples uh, they, t they took on, on, uh, on the asteroid Itokawa and he's gonna be also uh, next year in Australia to uh, recover the capsule of the Hayabusa 2 that uh, will take the samples. The, our Japanese colleagues are, are, uh, uh, have collected in, in, in asteroid Ryugu. Uh, so he has a long experience in, in, in space missions, in particular to asteroids. And uh, he is involved in all the human resource <coughs> uh, exploration of, of NASA. Uh, uh, he's been planning missions for uh, uh, going to, with crews to asteroids and explore the possibilities. Explore the possibilities of using asteroid materials in, uh, in uh, as resources for the <coughs> for the space uh, exploration. So uh, he's also a scient in the science teams of the LSST and the studies of, of uh, uh, small bodies of the solar system. Um, I think that's enough. <laughs> and he can, st he can start that it is much uh, more interesting than me. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Thanks. Uh, for that. So, uh, gusto. Uh, my name is uh, Paul. I uh, work at Johnson Space Center. commercial partners to enable human expansion across the solar system. 
but it begins with a return to the moon. And this is for long-term exploration. It's not just like we did in Apollo, where you go once a few times, and then, you know, it's been 50 years since we last did that. That's not really sustainable, as we say. We like to have a series of missions so we have a permanent human presence, or maybe long-term human presence at the moon. Okay, so that's the idea. We do the moon before we go to Mars. Mars is, as everybody knows, very, very far away. It's very, very hard to get to because of the distance, because it is so far away, right? So we're looking at, to go to Mars, two to three year mission. But the moon is three days away. So the idea is we want to explore the moon, learn how to operate beyond Earth, at a destination, live off planet, and learn so that then we can do these longer uh, duration missions to Mars. The program is going to be called Artemis. Artemis, uh, unlike Apollo, he had a twin sister, goddess of the moon, it's Artemis. And the idea, the goal that we have been given is to get back to the moon by 2024. This is a very challenging target very, very challenging to do, but we're, that's the goal that has been given NASA, that is our job, and so we're going to try our best to meet that 2024 deadline. The idea is we're going to send uh, the next man and the first woman to the moon by 2024. We're going to try and see how close we can get to that date. So here's the, here's the, the idea, the first phase of lunar exploration by 2024, and like Apollo, they landed on the near the equatorial region of the moon. This time, Artemis is going to go to the South Pole. The South Pole for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is because of the resources located in the polar region of the moon, particularly the South Pole. There's lots of volatiles that may be there, water ice that can be used as resources, can be used as life support, and also rocket fuel. So this is the idea, this is a cartoon. So we have Artemis 1, which will be a test flight. That'll be happening hopefully in maybe a year or two. And it's a test flight of our new Orion capsule. Be un uncrewed, no people on it, and it will go out and come back to Earth. Artemis 2 will be the second mission, but it will have crew on it. But it will go around the moon, not land on the moon, go around the moon and then come back to Earth. So it's a test of the life support systems with crew and things like that. Artemis 3 is the one that delivers the two people, two astronauts, to the Earth. Notice the timeline here. This is 2020 and this is 2024. Meanwhile, you also have support missions which build up the infrastructure both in orbit and on the lunar surface. So these are robotic missions to put things in place that can be utilized later on or learn about what is there on the lunar pole. And we're leveraging our commercial partners, so these are commercial payload services. Um, we're going to have a large scale lander, and I imagine we're going to have international partners that will be invited to join us in this effort. Okay? For the robotic portion. That's the first phase. That takes us to 2024. Then there's phase two. This is where we actually uh, start thinking about Mars forward capabilities. In other words, doing things that help you look about, look to live off planet, learn how to live off planet with the intent of utilizing that experience and those technologies that have been developed to help us go to Mars. Okay. So here the timeline is 2025 to about 2029, give or take. Okay. And this is where you have four, item five, item six, item seven, and you can see for each mission, we have a crew of two, crew of two, a crew of two, and then a crew of four. So the idea is we build up capability. At the same time, we see more and more assets, more and more vehicles, more and more robotic assets landed on the surface with the crew. Okay. So the idea is we have this long campaign, starting from phase one through phase two, where we start building up actually infrastructure, bases, rovers, 
things like that that will help us learn how to live off planet. The idea of that being utilized to go on the planet. So that's what we're planning so far. Okay. Any questions about this portion of the talk? This is what is planned. Yes. And I'll repeat the question for people online. Yeah. Are they planning? at the same spot. The idea is right now, maybe not exactly at the same spot, but in the general vicinity of the lunar cell, right? The first missions um, that go are planning to land in a specific area, so there may be some slight variation in the game experience, and the uh, game and operational accounting, right? So they may land a little bit further, but generally there is, the idea is to be confined to the south pole. That means, though, they may also have a new development capability. You see here, we have rovers. These are pressurized rovers where you can take a crew, maybe two people, we two people at the base here, two people go out, and may explore further away from the habitat. You take a crew of crews who live in this pressurized robotic excursion vehicle rover for maybe several days. So they can go out further explore. But the idea is that all these missions are in the same general vicinity, same location. Good question. So why at the beginning only two persons? Because in the Apollo mission we had three, so one unlucky guy had to be in the orbiter. <laughs> so this means nobody will be in the spaceship which is in the orbit. For how, lo how long in are, go are they going to be there in the moon? The, the rounds, the campaigns? I was wondering, I mean, is there, there needs to be some work on the legal framework for having, you know, living permanently on the moon, I guess, right? Because currently it's like no man's land, is it? Or, I mean, so uh? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> So a somewhat more technical question. That's a very ambitious schedule. Yeah. Um, and you're showing a lot of new hardware. A lot of that must be under development right now to make that those dates. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the question is how much of the hardware is being developed? So um, actually, most of this hardware is being developed right now. Um, so basically, the major component, let me go back, the major component so we have the, the rocket that is being built, which is the SLS, the Space Launch System. That is in work. The Orion vehicle and the uh, service module, which is European, that's all being built, and that should be ready. Uh, the landers are all being developed right now. The, the one major uh, call that we put out is the human lander system, and that's the, the major thing that we have to wait for to be developed. So that's what we call the most the long-term item, right, in terms of making this schedule. But everything else, I, we have plans for. 
I've seen this vehicle, that, that's, that's in work. This long duration habitat, there are plans for it. So things are being developed, but you're right, it's a very ambitious schedule, a very ambitious schedule. So that's what we have to, that's our, one of the, the main concerns. Okay, let me talk, uh, let's see.
I'm not hearing? Take off. Hang on one second. Let me get rid of this. Okay, so hopefully this is better for people online. Uh, so you can see these small impacts all over the world. There's no preference for where these objects hit. Okay? And the blue and gold colors represent nighttime and daytime impacts. Here's Chelyabinsk. This was the one of the largest ones in recent history. 500 kilotons of TNT. That was a very, very big explosion. The Tunguska event was um, much bigger. That was in 1908. And then, of course, the Chicxulub dinosaur uh, killer was estimated between 10 and 15 kilometers, right? And lots and lots of energy. Okay, so it's just to show you that we do get hit all the time. And this is why it's a, it's a world problem. It's something that we need to be aware of. Here's the orbits of four different dynamical classes of near-Earth asteroids. The ones that we are most interested for planetary defense and exploration are these guys, the Apollos and the Aetons, and that's because they're Earth-crossing. They actually come close and cross Earth's orbit. That makes them a potential hazard, but also makes a potential opportunity. Okay, now I'm going to go through the discovery rate just to give you an idea of how, uh, how we've learned about near-Earth asteroids and asteroids in general. So I'm going to go through, you're looking down on the solar system. The sun is in the center. Uh, you have the orbits of the inner solar system. Jupiter's orbit is off to scale. Okay? You're going to see green dots, yellow dots, and red dots. Those will appear. Okay? In 1800, we didn't know anything about asteroids in, at all. 1850, we have 10 asteroids known and named. 1900, we have now hundreds of known objects and some inside the orbit of Mars we've picked up. 1950, lots of known uh, objects with a handful of Earth-crossing ones. 1990, 9,000 known objects. 2000, now we have computers, automated search telescopes, things like that. A little over 86,000. 2007, August, getting really, really busy. And here's where we are as of just a few days ago. Okay? We are tracking more than 800,000 asteroids. Of that number, 21, a little over 21,000 are near-Earth asteroids. 2018 are what we call potentially hazardous asteroids. That means they come close enough to Earth and are of a sufficient size to give us a bad day. 108 near-Earth comets, but this is the population that we think exists, right? There are lots and lots of asteroids. So a couple of things I want you to take away from this particular slide, right? You look at Earth orbit and you see all the red dots around it, right? So that is what we call a target-rich environment, and that goes both ways, right? These asteroids are a potential threat, but also a potential opportunity. So we can go out and visit them, utilize them, understand them, and help learn about how to protect the planet at the same time, okay? So the other thing I should say is, especially for people online who are not here, do not freak out, okay? I sleep well at night, you should too. There's no danger that we know of at NASA and ESA and other space agencies of an asteroid coming towards Earth. But it just shows you that we have to be aware, and this is why we have a planetary defense program. This is why we have these things to help look for asteroids and defend the planet. I also made the dots very, very big on this slide, right? Asteroids are very small, space is very big. Right? If I made it to scale, you wouldn't see anything on these charts, and therefore it would lose the impact. Okay? So it's not like science fiction. I hope this movie works, but it's not like Star Wars. Okay? So let's see if this works. It does not, but it's not like that. Okay? It's not like you go through and there's the asteroids everywhere. Okay? It's not that way. Right? Successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. 
Okay, that's a lot of fun. That's completely, completely wrong. That's not how it is, and, and you guys know that, but I showed you just for, just for fun. Okay, so this is another chart to show you um, how we've been working since 1998 on the NASA Near Earth Object Observations Program. And this is the discovery rate of near Earth asteroids. And we were focusing more on the bigger objects, the one kilometer and up. This is the red curve diameter. One kilometer diameter and larger, we focus on those because those are the ones that can give us a really bad day, right? And if you look at the curve here, it's almost flattened out. We think we've got about 95 to 97 percent of those type of objects, which is really good, but we still have a lot more work to do, right? When you look at the yellow curve here, the gold curve, this is objects that are 140 meters and larger. Gives you an idea. Again, it's increasing over time. And the blue curve is everything. And you notice that shooting straight up. So that tells us there's lots and lots of objects left to discover, right? We have lots of work to do. And that's why we're developing these new systems, both ground-based and space-based systems, to help us look for these near-Earth asteroids. All right. So one of the things we want to do is, before we start thinking about going to near-Earth asteroids with people, we have some small uh, strategic knowledge gaps for small bodies, SKGs, strategic knowledge gaps. Okay? These are things that we need to know both for the scientific and engineering communities before we develop the systems and the techniques to go and look for these objects and go to them. All right? There's four themes. You want to know where you're going, where you're going, so you've got to identify the targets. You need to understand how to work and interact with the small body, the surface particularly. Understand the environment and its potential risks or benefit to the crew, right? So you want to understand whether, hey, some of these asteroids could be really good because we can burrow inside them and that may be radiation shielding. We can utilize some of the resources or some of them may be a little bit more dangerous or harder to work with, right? And then the resource potential, as I mentioned, water and precious metals that could be utilized in space, what we call in situ, there to help us with exploration. And this is one of the reasons why Phobos and Deimos are very attractive, because they're in orbit around Mars. We can utilize them to help explore Mars. So one of the things that um, Javier and Yulia has been helping me with is the NHATS, right? This is a, a, a mouthful but NASA likes acronyms. So this is the NASA Near Earth Object Human Spaceflight Accessible Target Study, NHATS. Okay? Say that fast a couple times. It was developed both by the Science Mission Directorate and the Human Exploration Mission Directorate. So this is both the Science and Human Exploration Directorates at NASA. Okay? It was based on a preliminary study in 2009 led by one of my colleagues, Brent Barbie. And then it was uh, conducted an official study by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 2010. And then we implemented it in 2012. Okay, so it's been running continuously since 2012. We want to identify the NEOs that might be accessible for human spaceflight missions. That's all it was. Just to identify what near-Earth asteroids are in great orbits for us to get to. Right? These um, basically focused on round trip missions because you want to have the astronauts come back. They do too. You don't want to just send them one way, but they have to come back. Round trip missions, looking at delta Vs of 12 kilometers per second or less total, and mission durations of 450 days or less. Okay? Here's the website. If you, if you are interested in going to it, you can uh, learn a lot about the, the human mission accessible targets. You can go in. This is what it looks like when you click on that link and go to it, okay? So you have uh, a data table, and you have the constraints here. You have your stay time, your total duration, uh, some of the launch dates, and then whether you care about a certain size or a certain orbit condition code or things like that in terms of confidence of the orbit. This is as of October 8th. So these are how many potential targets there are among the near-Earth asteroid population. If you expanded everything out, 12 kilometers per second limit, 450 days, right? These are the top, top 10 that pop up under this list. So this is the H magnitude, how bright they are. 
The estimated diameter range, based on a particular type, a range of material type. The delta V, in terms of minimum delta V required minimum mission duration. The number of trajectories, the year or the time frame when you can actually see them with optical ground-based. And then radar opportunities and others to look at them with radar, if they come close enough to with the radar. Okay. These two are really, really attractive. Okay, these two objects. The reason being is, notice they have the capability, the possibility of being above that 50 meter size range. Okay, so those two objects are of intense interest for us right now. There may be others that we're continuing looking for, but that's what those two are. Uh, these are the caveats. You can go there, don't bother reading it, but I just show you there's a whole bunch of caveats that we list that you can go through and figure out what the criteria are for making it onto that particular list. So here's HO3, 2016 HO3. This is one type of object. You notice, notice here, 154 day mission, round trip, okay? One of the things to notice here, this is the plot of launch date. This is an idea of the delta V required, right? So it does take a lot of delta V. If you want to go relatively quickly, almost 12 kilometers per second. If you don't want to go that fast, six kilometers, but it takes you a long time, right? But if you want to go there quickly, this particular object is in phase with the Earth and hangs out with the Earth in a very, very long period of time. So there's lots of opportunities, but the delta Vs are fairly large. That's one type of object that we're looking at. And again, that's one of the ones that's on the list, right? The other type of object is this one, 2000 SG344. Now, this has a different type of opportunity but you notice it has a really deep opportunity here in the 2028 time frame, right? 34 day round trip if you go with 12 kilometers per second delta V. But it's only available within this sort of window, right? But it presents a very, very good opportunity. You could get a very short duration mission. So you can imagine finding these asteroids out there which have these types of durations, right? mission durations, where you can start doing things like maybe this is one of the first missions we do, 34 days. Then we go maybe go to the other target that's maybe 100 days, 120 days, and so on. And then all of a sudden, your Mars exploration missions, which are three years, don't seem that challenging because you can bite off small chunks. And you can use the asteroids as test beds, little stepping stones, and also supply depots if they're full of water, if we choose the right one, to help you go and explore Mars. And then also Phobos and Deimos as well. That's what we're thinking. So again, just to recap, to highlight some of the objectives of the near-Earth asteroid mission, we want to do this in the future to help it provide experience, both in terms of the duration and the operational experience of going to Mars, right? It's not that we use the moon for learning how to live on Mars, but the asteroids of how to get to Mars, right? We want to use solar electric propulsion for both robotic and human exploration. We're doing very well at that with robotic, but we need to develop that also for human exploration. And then, of course, planetary defense, we want to enhance detection tracking. If you're looking for more and more targets for human exploration, the benefit is you find more and more targets that could be a hazard, and then you know how to deal with them. Yes, sir? Oh, solar electric propulsion is um, its ion engine. So basically, you have large solar arrays, and you ionize xenon, xenon uh, liquid, and you fire out xenon ions that are very heavy. We can, we, we have this technology, yeah. So basically, you have to carry the xenon with you, yeah. So you have to carry the xenon with you for the solar electric propulsion, right? If we're going to develop as the next phase of propulsion. For chemical propulsion, it's usually uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and that's where the water comes in. But you can imagine the missions leveraging solar electric propulsion, and then if you mine an asteroid and you have water there as rocket fuel, right? You can divide that in hydrogen and oxygen, then you can utilize that with chemical propulsion to go elsewhere, right? Or it could be also life support, or water is also very good at radiation shielding as well. So those are all the types of things that people are thinking about. 
Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so this, so planetary defense. Then we can actually develop techniques. One of the, the plans is if we go to these asteroids, we can actually test a deflection method. And then, of course, uh, for mining, both for expira uh, exploration and commercial use, right? There are some companies that are very interested in mining asteroids. All right, let's see if this works. It won't? Oh, it does. Good. It, it's very fun. Okay, that was incredibly fast, right? That would never, never happen that way, probably. But, but it's just to give you an idea of the thought behind it and why it would be really, really interesting, very challenging, but also very rewarding for uh, a variety of means. So this is my, um, my last, close to my last slide here. Um, and then we'll have hopefully some time for uh, extended discussion. But one of the things that asteroids, near-Earth asteroids in particular, are really, really important for uh, our four main, four main themes, right? And this is exploring our past, but securing our future. It's really, really vitally important. So for science, um, they reveal a lot about solar system history, right? The asteroids are the leftover building blocks from the earliest stages of solar system formation. So we can learn a lot about the solar system in general, but also how the Earth-Moon system may have formed, right? So this is something that's really, really of interesting for science. But in terms of also astrobiology, a lot of these asteroids, there's a group of, of uh, subset of these asteroids that have, are thought to have delivered a lot of the organic material and volatiles water to the early Earth. And they may have actually helped life form on this planet. So it's really, really interesting for the standpoint of science. For exploration, I just talked about this. this is, these asteroids could be really, really crucial in help us in helping us formulate the plans to go further into deep space beyond the moon, getting to Mars, and then maybe even further beyond that, right? Because then there's the whole asteroid belt that maybe we can utilize. So that's something that's really, really important to NASA and something that we're looking at. Planetary defense, obviously, this is something that's super important. Uh, it's the, the number one, actually the number one or number two, depending on how you rank it, in terms of people's minds what NASA should be doing, what they care about. Number one is climate change. Number two is defending the planet against asteroids and comets, right? So this is something that's really super important, and we take that very seriously at NASA. And then resources, developing an economy, but also utilizing the resources that may be in the asteroids that we could mine and, and extract that help us further exploration. And so this could open up the entire space-based economy and open up further exploration, science, planetary defense, and it's just a feedback loop. So the more you do, the more you get, okay? So this is my very last slide. So one day, one day, I hope in a not too distant future, after we do the moon and do those other things, this is an image, this is a, a painting uh, by a colleague of mine, uh, Bill Hartman, and this is an example of a human asteroid mission uh, taken from the perspective of 9 million or so, 10 million or so kilometers from the Earth-Moon system, okay? So here you have the asteroid, you have astronauts, their spacecraft, and here you can see the Earth-Moon system in the lower right-hand corner. And Earth is literally this pale blue dot. And it's a very, very precious planet, a very, very pre precious pale, do, pale blue dot that we have to protect. And so it really puts it in perspective. In fact, if you ask the 
astronauts on the International Space Station, what's their favorite planet? They always say Earth. Because you have a different perspective when you're in orbit, in space, looking back down at our home planet. Okay? So with that, I'll close. And if you have any questions, I'm happy. I can stay here as long as you want. And I will be happy to take questions. So thank you. Gracias. Right. So um, there are treaties in place. Um, again, this is a sort of above my pay grade because it's legal, but there have been uh, international legal uh, things brought forward because the Luxembourg government is very interested in uh, mining as well as the United States and a few other countries. Um, and there are some legal aspects that as long as you don't utilize the entire asteroid, it is okay. Right? The idea being that you can utilize a portion of a celestial object for the benefit of all because you're learning. Right? And it's the whole aspect of exploration for humanity. It's not just the United States. It's not just going to be JAXA, ESA. It, the idea is it's going to be an international effort, humanity expanding into the solar system. That's the idea. We'll see, again, there's always details to be worked out. Well, it, 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 I know it doesn't always work in that way, but that's what we have to try for, right? So the question is um, about the, the long-term funding and whether or not government agencies uh, can do it alone but need the commercial input. Right. Right. So the, the idea, your point's well taken. So this is why we invite our commercial partners along. And if you, if you saw on the charts that I had in the very first part of the presentation for the lunar exploration, um, we had inter international partners but also commercial partners that were helping deliver payloads to the service, right? And um, the idea is we do some of the hardest part, the government agencies do the hardest part, so NASA does the more difficult but we rely on the commercial partners to help back us up. So right now, if you notice, um, we have efforts on the International Space Station for uh, SpaceX and a few other companies to help deliver our astronauts uh, to the International Space Station so that we can be freed up, NASA and ESA and other countries can be freed up to do uh, other things, right, in deep space. So your point is well taken. Commercial companies are gonna be vitally, vitally important for any type of exploration in the future, right? There, but there are certain things that government agencies are just going to have to do, you know, initially to, to build up the infrastructure, to build up the capabilities of exploration and habitation for long term as you move out into the, also from the moon, but also into the solar system, right? One of the things too is like, for example, planetary defense, there's not a commercial model for planetary defense. That, definitely should be government, and that's one of the things that we're focused on. I don't think anybody really wants to rely on a commercial company for planetary defense, right? We're going to pay you so much, eh, we don't decide you didn't pay us, so we're not going to protect the planet. I mean, that's crazy, and that would never happen. But those type of efforts are good for government. Commercial are good for following along behind government to help support. But you're right, we need commercial partners.
So we would welcome a combination based on proven record, right? So the companies have to prove their, their value. Um, they have to prove their capability. But yeah, we welcome, we would welcome those type of efforts, but we have to at first address the need that we have first. In other words, help us get supplies to the surface, for example. Help us um, get a lander to the surface to carry our astronauts. Help us understand the type of resources that may be there. That's not to say that NASA itself doesn't do some of the other things as well, but commercial companies will help us. But again, it's a coordinated effort, right? So we would welcome. For sure. So an interstellar object? Uh, so we have we have examples of two right now um, that we know of. Um, and uh, congratulations to Yulia and Javier for getting the first spectrum of the, of the second one, uh, which is an amazing, amazing result. Um, I think uh, the, the problem with interstellar objects is right now we don't have any plans to, to uh, explore those, especially with people. Possibly robotically, maybe later on we might be able to consider something like that. But the problem is they're uh, few and far between currently right now with our detection systems. They're hard to identify. Um, they're also moved because of the nature of where they're coming from and their trajectories. They move ex extremely fast, and you don't have a lot of time to plan. So right now, uh, we don't have the plans or technology to uh, visit one. If we did do it in the near future, uh, it would be robotic. It would be a robotic mission, uh, and it would be almost like we'd have to do um, uh, a flyby. It wouldn't be a rendezvous. But it's something that people are interested in, and, and people have thought about, you know, drawing on the back of an envelope and things like that. Um, but it's, it's a very challenging, a very challenging mission. But it's something that, it's another type of object that obviously we'd like to go to. The, the, the F-class mission, yeah. Comdet Interceptor. Right. Or cloud, yep. Right. But still, you have to be lucky that you get, and uh, it, it's a great mission, great idea, but the chances of it are getting an interstellar may be tough. So, any other questions? There's one down in front. Philosophical? Mm hmm. Right, right, right. So the idea, so what you're talking about is planetary protection. So I talked about planetary defense from asteroids. Planetary protection is uh, both forward and backward contamination of sending astronauts or robots to the surface of another planet, getting a sample, and then bringing it back. So forward contamination is obviously going there and contaminating the moon or, or Mars or something. And then backward contamination is bringing those samples back and then contaminating or doing something that may be not so good for Earth, okay? So that's planetary protection, and we have a whole um, office. We also work with uh, the other uh, international space agencies to look specifically at planetary protection. Uh, for the moon, uh, it is what we call category one. In other words, there's no risk, both forward and backward, um, because of the high, high radiation environment and the temperatures. 
the moon does not have a lot of organics, much at all. Um, so for the moon, it's not a problem. It's not to say that we don't take it seriously. We still try and keep spacecraft clean, astronauts, you know, contained, clean. We keep the environments clean. So if we go somewhere, we will make sure to, to keep the environment clean as possible. But for the moon, it's not as much problem because it's an airless body, high radiation environment. Uh, the same thing with asteroids and also Phobos and Deimos. Very, very intense radiation. Um, and we just had uh, um, an analysis of the Planetary Protection International community about returning a sample from Phobos because there's a Japanese mission called MMX, which we are partnered with, with the Japanese, JAXA, on MMX, um, to uh, bring a sample back from Phobos. So some of those samples may contain some Martian material. But again, because they've been in a very high radiation environment, very wide temperature regimes, it's not considered a, a, a potential threat, both from backward and forward contamination. Where it becomes interesting is when you talk about Mars. And that's, we haven't uh, addressed or thought about all the ramifications yet of how you would do that properly. But one of the things to think about is if you work on the moon, you can develop the technologies and the procedures and the protocols to help you test. You know how clean you can be for Mars later, right? So you can test, hey, I've got astronauts living on a base 30 days. How dirty do they make the base around the area? How dirty do they make the surrounding soil? How dirty are the samples that they bring back, the containment and the procedures? So the idea is that we can test what we need to do for Mars so that we don't make a bad situation on Mars and also a bad situation on Earth. I will tell you that any samples that come back from Mars will have to be highly contained just to be sure. Most of the people in the scientific community think that there shouldn't be a problem because we already have Martian material on Earth from the meteorites. We have a few Martian materials. Um, but again, we have to be sure. We have to be careful. Uh, and so any material that comes back from Mars will be contained in a very, what we call class five biohazard containment facility. But the idea with doing these type of missions to the moon and then the asteroids, is you get to test those procedures, those protocols, to make sure your planetary protection is, is good. So it's a very good question. But it's something we are thinking about very seriously. So one of the things that the companies have to do, so it's a good question, so I'll answer it in a couple of ways. Um, the first question is, in order for the companies to launch from whatever host country they are operating from, they have to have a license. And they have to go through certain protocols. And the model that we would probably use in this case is something from, for orbital debris, right? So orbital debris is a big issue. And we'd have to, uh, they'd have to be able to prove that they're not going to make a hazard for orbital debris, but also not do anything harmful, detrimental to the asteroid or near-Earth environment. But more importantly, the second part of your question is, if they did liberate any small particles off the asteroid, right, um, those particles do not stay around the asteroid. They get actually swept out by the sun. Solar radiation pressure is very, very useful in sweeping those away. And all of a sudden, those particles, dust, will scatter and distribute and be swept up by the other planets. They don't last very long. And so the potential for a hazard in near-Earth space would be really, really minimal. 
currently the the way we we send spacecraft uh, out to if we're going to do human spacecraft out to the moon and also to the ISS there's a certain amount of shielding that we have to counteract any type of orbital debris or micrometeoroid impact so some of the spacecraft for human missions are armored right they have in the leading edge where they may encounter any type of debris both natural or human made they have armor um, but more importantly we know that we've sent spacecraft uh, through these dust areas occasionally they'd get a little ding but nothing terrible enough to take out the, the spacecraft where it becomes more interesting is when we pass through a dense cometary tail or something like that you know there's a chance where you've encountered strong amount of dust that's been recently liberated and earth flies through that stream that's when uh, you have to be worried about your geostationary satellites and some of the other things but for near-earth asteroids they're relatively far away that amount of dust would be dispersed by the solar radiation pressure but again we'd have to make sure that the companies with a license would have to adhere to certain restrictions and protocols and controls to make sure they don't do any harm in the in the environment as well as at the asteroid so it's a good question. Well, that w I guess that would be great. I mean, that would be great from our perspective uh, because then they're like, okay, well, we don't have to do anything. Um, but no. Um, so actually, what you what you should be aware of is that a lot of people at NASA are working with SpaceX, right? So we're working in partnerships. Um, there is always the possibility that a commercial partner uh, develops a capability um, that may help get to a certain destination more quickly and more efficiently than a government agency. There's always that possibility. Um, I think if we had that capability and possibility, we'd welcome it. Um, you've seen the innovations that they've, SpaceX have done with their launch uh, system, particularly their Falcon, uh, Falcon Heavy, the boosters coming back and reusability and things like that. That makes sense, and we welcome that. But keep in mind, a lot of NASA people helped SpaceX with that particular technology, right? So it's not just SpaceX doing this by themselves. Yes, they're a main driver, but we are helping them, right, behind the scenes. But it is SpaceX, and they do some really great work. So I think if they develop the capability to go back to the moon or go to the moon or go to Mars or however, we're, you know, they have long-term plans. Elon Musk is a visionary, and he has a lot of – we'd be more than happy to, to help them and work with them. So that'd be great. I mean, it's a win-win for both sides. So I have no problem with commercial people – commercial companies, international partners. This is, this is humanity. This is humankind. This is something that's super, super important, and we should all do it together and not worry about who did it first or who gets the credit or anything. Let's just do it. Muchas gracias.